So who is here? We can already start uh, something. Do you? Because you see on the wall, we read it here, Nastenu Vapros. Oh, sorry, I will, I will do it in English. Yeah. You see on the wall the question, what do I associate with fear? And now I will connect it to the internet. And then everybody can just in his normal cell phone. Put in menti.com, E-M-E-N-T-I.com, like you see there, menti.com, and put this code in, 459603, and then you can write what you associate with fear. There's, I think, options with three uh, words, and you can just type words in that come into your mind when you hear fear, like three spontaneous associations you, you get when you see when you think about fear. Does it work? Did does anybody try already? Very good. I will I will leave the time because um, now other people can type it in also who, who come in later. I will uh, uh, r r remind them and then we will see a graphic of different words that many people probably come into their mind when they speak about fear, when they hear fear. Um, you can use the language you like most. As far as I know, menti.com speaks any language. <laughs> in the big question whether Navalny Alexei is a populist or a democrat I, I just have to say he mobilized already quite well to bring people back in So basically, what you see on the wall, also um, Alexei rightly uh, mobilized to come back in because it is, it has, it's a democratic element of our discussion that you type in your mobile form just the internet address menti.com, menti.com, and then you can use this code 459603 as you see here, and then you just write three words that you associate with fear. Because we will do something. Um, Ale Alexei, thank you very much for helping them uh, to bring them in. Quiz. No. 
no, sorry. That didn't work. Because it, it had it was cheap design. Now I feel stupid. What? Finally we see it. Okay. So first you see now what people associate with fear. And it's always changing to your answers. But in the moment, the biggest associations with fear is clearly negative. That's very visible. Death, danger, uncertainty, war, pain, violence. And then we see repression, anger, paralysis. We see finally a name, Putin. Anger, prison, violence. Future, slabbest. So it is clear that we mostly associate with fear negative terms, and that is quite important uh, to conceptualize about it because we spoke in the beginning when we said overcome fear. Of course, we, we see this, but on the other hand, of course, fear is also a driver that makes us alert, that makes us awake, that is something that where we feel that uh, uh, our wi life is serious because we probably are reminded of the dangers that come with fear and sometimes that can also awaken all our senses. What wa our role is on this panel is now to talk a little bit about these concepts and I want to introduce you to the panel. Um, Sabine Leuterser Schnarrenberger, very well known in many countries that deal with human rights because she was very active in the Council of Europe as a parliamentarian. In Germany, she's famous as a former, or as the only minister of uh, any German government that stepped down for value reasons and not for a power struggle, because she didn't want to, to support the liberals uh, um, going into a surveillance uh, law. And as a justice minister, she didn't want to do that. So welcome. Sergei Guriev is uh, very famous as an economist, not only uh, former dean of the New Economic School, but also uh, known in very Ameri many American universities, but currently a professor of the Sciences Po Par Paris, and for the last three years also the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Pop, a, a good example for me as an economist that doesn't only s speak about economics, but also about populism, about trust, and these relations to economics. Thank you very much that you're here with us. <laughs> and last but not least, Katarina Pizars Katarzyna Pizarska, uh, who uh, just managed to run the gigantic Warsaw Security Forum, and uh, after that came here to us as a social entrepreneur, as a representative of civil society and also the founder of the European Academy for Diplomacy. Uh, thank you very much to join us. <laughs> Basically looking up and at this concepts of uh, fear, probably I sit down. Yes, that's probably a little bit less threatening. So we see this concept uh, on the wall and uh, Sabine Leuter Sachnanberger, you just wrote a book um, which is in English, I think, translated as uh, uh, Fear Eats Freedom. Um, when you see at these associations with fear, um, how do you think that this, this fear is dangerous to our society? Is this and techniques, okay. I'm not very astonished about these uh, words, about the negative terms uh, regarding fear, because uh, fear is uh, something who makes us unfree. Because if we have fear, we will not use our rights. We have in different way constituted in uh, constitutions, uh, in Germany, in our uh, constitution there, we have 19 articles 
um, celebrating their uh, human rights. And uh, fear, so I think fear is something uh, that you uh, that makes you not only unfree, but you will change your behavior. If your thoughts, your feelings, your decisions may be driven by fear, you are reduced uh, to a slave of fear. And that's the opposite of what liberal wants for people. They want that uh, people can live their freedoms. Uh, I, you mentioned it, Julius, uh, quit my job as Minister of Justice, now uh, 1996, oh, uh, long away, um, in the past, because I don't want to support um, new uh, legislation um, allowing mass uh, surveillance of people uh, living in their own rooms. Uh, and so I quit my job because... Uh, I wasn't, um, um, I, I couldn't agree how to deal with fear, fear and to be afraid uh, regarding organized crimes, regarding terrorism attacks, something like that. Yeah, therefore we need security, we need a state who is able uh, to um, uh, set our law into force, but it's not the right way only to have more penal laws, more surveillance, and less of freedom. So yep. uh, you also have to find the right balance between, on the one um, uh, hand, uh, uh, security, security measures, to strengthen also state authorities, and on the other uh, hand, to um, protect the freedom, the guaranteed freedoms. <laughs> and we have, I think, politics yep. in, um, in uh, different countries only regarding to have perhaps more security. I don't think so, that more uh, uh, stronger laws will uh, give you more security. But you are not regarding the freedom and the human rights, and I think this is really you went, a dangerous you went, development. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, it was already a plaidoyer for kind of uh, the protection of liberal society um, in, 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 in this uh, concept of the danger that uh, surveillance leads to an atmosphere of fear. Um, uh, Sergei, also like as an economist, is there any economic impact from, from, from fear? As, uh, because you published a lot about trust and the relationship and trust in society. Is there also a positive impact from fear? Thank you very much, Julius. And uh, before I answer your question, I would like to thank the organizers of the forum for this excellent event. And this is the first time I speak at the forum, and for me it's a great honor. And uh, indeed, uh, I would like uh, to commemorate uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov's uh, contribution to all these wonderful things uh, we are discussing here. And uh, I, uh, I just was uh, uh, thinking about this, that the last time I I was um, uh, corresponding uh, with uh, Boris and actually Alexei's colleagues, uh, Leonid Volker was two days uh, before he was killed. It was a preparation for this uh, march of March 1st, uh, where Alexei was in jail, Leonid and Boris were working on the march. And uh, I, I remember that that's always been work for freedom, work against fear. And that particular uh, march was actually about a positive agenda, and uh, the organizers of the march insisted that we should not talk about fear and repression, but we should talk about the change we need to bring and the demands we need to put forward and, and, and transform, um, transform the society and, and the economy, actually, in that, in, in that case. So uh, talking, talking about uh, your question, Yes, uh, I'm very happy that in the previous session we talked a lot about trust, and uh, indeed Professor Fukuyama has written a seminal book more than 20 years ago about that, and trust is uh, c positively contributing to development. There is now a lot more quantitative work which shows that trust contributes to development. What else positively contributes to development? Uh, patience, long-term orientation. What else contributes to development? R risk taking, and risk taking is of course something which is quite opposite from fear. What else, uh, what are other cultural norms and attitudes that positively contribute to economic growth and development? Uh, what uh, uh, Geert Hofstede would say, uh, distance to power 
In the United States, Americans believe that power is close. Power is something that should be not too far away and should be accountable to us. In countries like Russia and China, this measure is uh, given something completely different. Power is uh, somewhere away, power is divine, power is sacred, and we should be afraid of power. And uh, you can see how attitudes like this are actually negatively affecting development. And uh, so in that sense, I cannot say anything good about fear as a, as a uh, measure, as a, as, a, as a feature, as a cultural attitude that uh, promotes development. I've also worked on, on uh, Stalin's industrialization and uh, one of the uh, takeaways from our research on Stalin's industrialization is yes, it was based on fear, but it was not as successful as people in this uh, post-Soviet mythology believe it was. It was not actually very efficient and effective and uh, industrialization based on fear cannot get you too far and that's probably why Soviet Union eventually fell apart because uh, innovation con cannot be driven by fear and competition cannot be driven by fear and productivity growth cannot be driven by fear. Okay, that's from an economic perspective <laughs> very very clear uh, um, uh, judgment. Um, now, I mean, you are also in public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is, is, is about society, but it is also like a form of diplomacy, of state communication towards other societies. Um, uh, how does fear play into that field? Well, well, let me start. Can you hear me? Okay, let me start uh, by saying um, that uh, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be here. And uh, many years ago, 2011, I was in a panel with Boris Nemtsov. This was the only time I actually met him. And one thing I would say about him, as I would say about many people who are in this room, uh, who today live uh, and fight in Russia, is that you are fearless. And that fearlessness is probably what authority uh, fears the most. The fact that people are not afraid of it. And fear itself is very much related, especially in democracies, with trust. Much of my experience comes uh, for uh, the many years I lived in the United States. And when I came back to Poland in the early 1990s as a relatively young person, I remember I was surprised that people don't trust each other. So if you are asked, what is your name, and you said your name, you're asked to show a document. In the United States, nobody would ever question uh, me telling my name, yes? I would come to, the, to, to an office and if I said that's my name, they would just write down whatever I said and, and that would be it. Of course, it could be abused and one of, one of my huge, uh, huge uh, mentors and people I respected, Zbigniew Brzezinski, once actually walked around Washington with me and said, look, I'm going to write Osama Bin Laden in every, in every book when you enter a, a building because nobody checks it here. So he went and actually wrote Osama Bin Laden and went upstairs to the... So, but that shows you that democratic societies are based on trust. They're based on the assumption that uh, people tell the truth, that they're not afraid to reveal who they are, that uh, very often even, even uh, quite, uh, quite complicated processes are done based on trust. And the fact that this trust uh, disappears, and we see that more and more in many societies, also destroys the very layer of democracy as, uh, as such. And I'm sure we will talk more about how, this is going, how does this impact civil society, how it impacts you know, democracy, the deterioration of democracy, but I think we have to make that critical link. Fear equals the end of trust in the society, and without trust, you cannot have a real democracy. Okay, but this uh, directly adds then to the question to Sabine, um, when you are saying that there is this danger of uh, securitization. I mean, this is something in the US where at least people were not so afraid of uh, anti-terror legislation, but still anti-terror legislation can uh, uh, affect uh, people to be afraid to say certain things and so on. How do you rebuild this trust? What do we have to offer to rebuild such trust? First, I agree we need trust in democracy uh, to trust each other and to have trust in state authorities, in procedures there, and in, yes, poli in policy in general, in politics in general. Um, and 
it's not the opposite to say uh, I don't want too much uh, legislation dealing with terrorism. I don't want to give state authorities, security forces, and so on, more and more measures to, um, to, uh, to have more uh, personal details and data about all the people. Uh, I think you always have to balance both. And that is difficult because you have to declare, you have to tell a story about it. It's not so easy to say, yes, we have a new law, a new le legislation, we have more technique, we have now the internet to, an internet to survey all the people, so we have more security, so we make uh, the best thing you want, so you can live safe uh, in your environment. That's easy to tell, and this is a story uh, what is the counter story? The counter story is, no, first, you don't have more security. Only uh, those who want that are telling this. But there is no evidence for that, that more and more um, people in state authorities in all these different uh, uh, law enforcement uh, um, uh, entities uh, will bring you more uh, security in your society and you will be more successful fighting terrorism and other challenges. That's the first. But it's uh, not an easy story. Uh, that's the first you have to, to say. The second is you all can be victim of surveillance without any reason. You are no terrorist, you are no criminal, but you are a victim of surveillance. And then you can declare this. And you have uh, specific cases to declare this. Uh, so you need uh, to protect also these human rights, these freedoms, freedom of opinion, freedom to uh, demonstrate, f uh, privacy, protection of privacy and so on. For that, you need this balance to find between security measures on the one hand and um, the protection of uh, human rights. This is uh, not easy, I have to say, mm. because in Germany there are always uh, surveys on, on this um, issue and perhaps in good times, 35% uh, are in favor of this story I uh, told you uh, to find this balance. It's much more easier to have a majority for your opinion to uh, strengthen or to do everything uh, to have uh, this um, reported uh, security. And I mean, uh, Sergei, one of the reasons why you left Russia was, that, as you always said, that you already felt over a time that freedoms were limited that you could uh, experience um, do you see um, is this also in russia following the same argument of securitization against a threat from the outside or an internal threat um, and do you see this trend going on i think it's a, it's a great question and the argument of security is always used in russia to limit freedoms and to actually to limit uh, European integration, European way of development, European social model is always opposed by Russian state in this example, uh, by, the, by this argument that Russia is always under threat. And this is exactly where, when we talk about national identity, and there was a discussion in the last panel, what is Russian national identity? A lot of people actually have been brought up by Russian history books where Russia is always encircled by enemies who always try to get our land, and Russia is encircled, so it needs to defend itself, so it needs to grab neighbor's lands to defend itself, and more and more and more. And so, and people think in those terms, and you always can sell this idea that we need security, and that's why we need to tighten our belts. Mm -hmm. we, we need security, and that's why we cannot afford to talk about corruption. We cannot afford talking about reforms. And so these are, these are the arguments. And uh, just uh, to offer an alternative uh, national identity, we cannot be too pessimistic, right? So I should say that there is an alternative national identity based on Russian 19th century literature or 20th century literature. That we will also discuss later because we will exactly. have the tolstoy stalipian discussion exactly. afterwards. Exactly. But uh, luckily Russia has more writers than Tolstoy, and, uh, and in general it's indeed about issues related to justice and mercy and, and magnanimity 
And so all these all this, uh, values that eventually are positive values, not the values uh, related to fear of losing land, a fear of uh, losing security. And, and so I think we need a more positive narrative, more positive national identity, and that may exist because there is a Russian cultural dimension which is more positive and more uh, pro-social. Yeah, this is, uh, thank you very much to overcome this myth that this is the only driver of Russian history is about, about, about this. Another country this, that... Uh, this is an implication of a specific narrative which was put in Russian history school, school uh, middle school, high school textbooks, and everybody learned history from those books, and now everybody has been brought up by those history textbooks, and people who have not read other textbooks still live in that world. Or, or reading even the same authors. I remember there was a seminar about Gordiaev, uh, where I finally understood that one of the conservative authors Putin recommended to his governors was actually a radical individualist, left the Orthodox Church uh, despite being uh, uh, very, because he disliked the institutions. Another country uh, where history is very important and also where the encirclement is very well known, and also for historic reasons, as we know, that uh, Poland was uh, several times in the last century encircled and uh, uh, attacked, especially by the countries we come from, from Russia and Germany. Uh, but um, how, how dangerous is in Poland uh, to speak only about this aspect of history, and does it have an, an, a contemporary impact? Do you think that current, hist current politics in Poland is still defined by this kind of fear of the encirclement? You know, I, I think personally that politics in Poland are defined by a post-war trauma. And uh, they're defined by maybe a general historical trauma. This is a trauma that on the one side, of course, comes from this constant encirclement by great powers that have divided, partitioned Poland, the need to survive as a nation, the need to be homogeneous, just like the Kurds today, to kind of, you know, stand out there uh, in our identity. But then also the trauma that comes from abandonment. So the West has abandoned us in 1945. They sold us out, uh, although we fought uh, on the right side, on the side of the Allies, for years and years. So these two are, are very, you know, very deep uh, traumas that are within, I think, societies. And because my, 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 my good friend, uh, that uh, a British friend, always says that in Poland, everybody has, uh, it, it takes history in their backpack. So it's enough that you come up to somebody and say something, and they come take out the history and they talk about history so history is incredibly alive but having said that history can be also abused like in every country it can be a very strong political tool to create enemies and to create uh, where yeah. they're not when where they're not and interestingly enough what i've noticed for years and years that populist governments uh, usually pick the weak enemies not the real enemies because the weak enemies are those who can't do you any harm so those who are probably not even enemies, they might be even your friends, but you focus on them because it's easier to ra rally, uh, rally, uh, you know, national interest, uh, I mean, national public around, uh, around this. Whereas real enemies are, you don't want to poke them. I'll give you the example on this. We've seen in the last two, three years, a very big change of rhetoric towards Germany. In Poland. So from, you know, the rhetoric, wow, we made an incredible reconciliation process for 25 years. The, the process was, uh, was of course, uh, a long one. It required the de uh, development of political relations, civil society relations, and so on, to a change of rhetoric that uh, says, well, actually, Germany should not be trusted because there was no reparations after the war, because, you know, they're dominating in Europe, because their interest is not our interest, and so on and so forth. You've seen this in other countries, Greece and so on. It's not only, but, but I think that focus was not even because of the anti-German sentiment. On the contrary, 80% of Poles say that Germans are our friends, still, yeah, D despite of, of this. But I think it was just an easy, easy enemy. The same with Ukrainians. You know, it's but, easy to say. But can, uh, can this not backfire? But if 80% have a positive relations mm -hmm. with Germany, don't they feel alienated if the government says the opposite? No, I think that's the problem, that uh, you know, people at the end of the day are very perceptive. For, uh, if you bring out history and you remind them and say, oh, but this and that, and this wasn't, you know, they destroyed Warsaw, 
the Nazi Germans destroyed uh, Warsaw. They never paid for it. Look, this is the bill for Warsaw. That is billions and billions. And so people start to reflect, okay, I mean, so they owe us something, yes? And I think and this is the least of the problems. But what I see as a problem today is uh, our relationship with Ukraine. Because there again, history was taken out. And by the way, very skillfully used also by Russia propaganda. If you look on what Russian Kremlin propaganda focuses now, who do they pay? Uh, which portals do they support? They're usually anti-Ukrainian portals in Poland. And they focus on historical grievances, which are real. There are black histories in our relations. But instead of trying to work them out, uh, we just put one nation uh, uh, against the other. And the question is, of course, who gains? And the, the last thing I'll just say, I don't see that much attention towards Russia. I would like to hear on you know, television saying, uh, not Russia, but Kremlin, yeah, Putin, saying, you know, uh, this is the real threat. And of course, people know this is the real threat, uh, but that's not what the political message is about. So when I say you, you pick the weaker, weaker side, I'm saying that this is a very uh, strong tool of managing fear, very often where there are no enemies and we can even label friends as enemies. I mean, as a, as a friend of Poland, um, as a German also, you, you see, you, you hear this, uh, you, 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 you nodded when she described the processes. In German, the media mainly writes in the moment about how the uh, rule of law is under threat in Poland because of the, the changing role of courts, because of new laws. What do you answer as a German politician to that? Uh, yes, first, uh, I think um, this is one point that uh, people and that and members of government, uh, power chancellor and others, are not talking enough about these points, about history, understanding, and so on. And perhaps we have a similar process in Germany, in the unified Germany, East and West. There is a division between uh, the feeling people living uh, in, uh, yes, former Eastern Germany now in these five lands and uh, in, in Western Germany. And it's a question, question of, yes, recognition. It's also a question of speaking about their life, that they also had their lives and not uh, the lives um, violating human rights because they lived in another system, authoritarian system, but they had their life and they had uh, their um, um, advantages and that they, they had their success. So I think it's really problematic, I think, uh, the, um, uh, to try to speak French, Germany and Poland in Weimar, um, um, context triangle, uh, I think, was a good beginning, but now uh, it's it's weakened. It's not an instrument in the European Union, and that's not good uh, regarding uh, yes these um, uh, this way to instrumentalize uh, these history moments um, uh, against Germany. And I think that's one important point to instrumentalize fears. Um, weak enemy is one you have explained. Another is refugees. Mm -hmm. is That's refugee a weak enemy. Is a refugee weak, is weak a weak enemy. enemy. It's yes. an enemy it's that's a weak definition. enemy. Yeah. Or in Germany, I have to say it, um, people with Jewish religion. They are weak enemies. They are only living 200,000. And today we had uh, uh, an attack in, in Halle, in a city in um, East, um, Eastern Germany, um, uh, in the surrounding of a synagogue, and two uh, people were, murder were murdered. We don't know exactly what has happened. But these are all weak enemies. And we have now also populism party, one populism party, alternative for um, Germany. And they are saying, for example, we are defending, we are the best friends of uh, Jewish people because we are against uh, Muslims totally Muslims. We don't want any Muslim in Germany. So we have to control the borders, to close them, and so on. Mm -hmm. This populism, this is a weak enemy, and this spreads um, not trust 
among the people, among the societies. And so I think, uh, yes, I agree um, uh, to uh, your um, analysis. And then, uh, Sergei, because you published also about the roots of populism, we heard today also from Francis Fukuyama, um, his uh, uh, analysis, how important perception of identity, of recognition are for the, uh, for, for the rise of populism not in, in many countries, um, and also we heard that it's the fear of weak enemies, but in Russia I think it is also the fear of a strong enemy, because in Russia it was uh, is always instrumentalized that it's always the State Department between every, uh, US State Department behind everything, and I think they are strong, um, they are a strong enemy to pick. But um, are there also economic drivers of, of populism? Because we were debating that a little bit. Yes, uh, it's, it's a great question. And you have different kinds of fears that populists use and different kind, kinds of enemies they select. And in many cases, indeed, it's, it's driven by economic factors that trigger and activate the cultural divides and cultural attitudes that uh, need to find an enemy. But indeed, in Russia, you have this strong enemy, State Department or whatever other West that uh, Russian government needs, and it's not driven by this populist uh, movement. We just need an enemy which would explain why incomes are not growing. So you've promised income growth, you've promised development, it's not happening. What can you say? You can say this is all because of State Department. If you say it's because of uh, Republic of Georgia, it will not be enough. You need a stronger enemy for this, so, and then they choose State Department. Then the fears of, uh, uh, you also mentioned at some point, banks or other economic players. This is a typical uh, populist uh, narrative that we need to fight the elites, right? That's, that's uh, normal, and, and this is not a Russia story, it's, it's uh, all over the world. And there is some truth in the fact that bankers during, during the last uh, economic and financial crisis did things which I would not expect to see in my life, like manipulating the labor market and stuff like that. Um, then another thing is immigrants, refugees, external enemies, and this is directly linked to what uh, Professor Fukuyama was talking about. So populism is not just about resisting elites, it's also about homogenizing the people. You need to make sure that there is no place for diversity and liberalism. People are the same. We are all the same of this, uh, all, all part of the same identity. How do you define the identity? What is common between all the Poles mm -hmm. all, or all, all the Russians? You need somebody who's not Pol Polish, who's not Russian. And for that, an immigrant or a Muslim, in, in some cases, uh, represents... One example, there was the, the Polish man in the United Kingdom who has driven the exactly. Brexit referendum. The Polish plumber. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, yeah, the Polish plumber. That's, yes. that's actually true. Interestingly, of course, uh, people who voted for Brexit mostly lived in areas uh, where there is no immigration. Uh, but uh, still, yes, it, wasn't, it was also an economic argument, and there is research which shows that, indeed, uh, immigration from the Eastern Europe, and in particular from Poland, was an important economic driver of, of Brexit vote. But any, anyway, what I'm saying is, Immigrants and refugees are used by populists because in order to define who we are, we need to point at somebody who's different. Mm -hmm. And that creates the opportunity to, to say we are the same, we don't need checks and balances, we don't need diversity, we don't need institutions. I alone will be speaking for all of us. And that's why immigration and refugees are so important for populist narrative. That's also now interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah if I can, if I can just um, briefly add to this, uh, I think there's two points also that have to be made. First of all, fear is not anything new. I mean, in democratic societies, fear was always there. I can imagine the fear that a white person had when segregation ended in the South. Yes, there were so many examples where actually uh, people rejected change. They said, no, we don't want that in democratic societies. Now, what is different today? And I reflected on this again and again. Why uh, this fear has taken such a huge, a huge uh, size uh, that we see a polarization is, uh, which as Professor Fukuyama said, uh, people don't want to even see their kids marrying somebody that's a Republican or marrying somebody that's a Democrat. That, you know, that's pretty much crazy even for American history to have happened. Well, I blame, to tell you the truth, social media and the speeding up of time. 
So today, if you are a young person, the amount of information and the amount of bad information you receive from so many different uh, uh, sources, uh, very often contradictory, uh, information that makes you question every type of authority, the, makes people very much confused and felt feel felt you know lost in the world. I work mainly with young leaders, and to tell you the truth, especially in the West, but also here in Poland, people don't really look up to anybody anymore. If you ask them, what is you know, who do you respect? Who's your you know somebody? Yeah, who do you trust? That and again we come back to trust. Who do you trust? They're not able to give a single person, maybe in family. Maybe my father, maybe my mother, if they're really role, role models, but they just don't trust anything and anyone. And that, of course, comes back to democracy. If you cannot trust anyone, and then why, why would you trust the democratic system itself? So I think this is a major, major issue that is not only a, question, a problem today here in Poland, but it's also a question in all Western, all Western uh, societies. That's very interesting because still the most popular politician in Germany is Angela Merkel and the most trusted uh, politician. But if you lo listen to Russian state television, um, another, uh, another story to the Ukraine story is that the West and uh, specifically also Germany is falling apart because there are so many refugees running through German streets and raping German women and uh, they, they basically, no, no woman is safe anymore in Germany. And that is, uh, we have at the same time uh, also people criticizing Angela Merkel that when she said in the midst of the crisis, she said, we will do it. Uh, she gave basically the opposite example to fear. She said, yes, we can. But many people say that bes because of that, also the populists, the right-wing populists were rising in Germany. What do you say to that? Uh, first, look um, at some uh, data. There are maximum... 15 or 16 percent in Germany, in whole Germany, who are supporting this populist party. Not more. We have in some lands some more um, uh, data, 20 percent or something like that. But there are more than 80 percent who are not supporting uh, this populist party. So. Uh, we are not in a situation that we only have this fear, only this fighting against uh, foreigners in general, against refugees and so on. But we have this discussion, we have the social media, and we have the hate and defamation and disinformation, uh, but we have also other things. So what we need is we have um, to support all initiatives to um, declare, to show the facts, not the fakes, but the facts, um, to inform. And there are a lot of them. Uh, my foundation, our foundation, is supporting some of these in initiatives in uh, Germany. And Angela Merkel, yes, he um, is the most uh, hated uh, politician in Germany, but also one uh, who most of the people trust in. And I, and I supported her all the time. I was a member of her government until 2013, uh, before the beginning of refugees coming um, more and more. This was 2015. But this was a time where the alternative uh, for um, Germany was beginning. There, the enemy was European Union, fighting against European Union, Be uh, li uh, yeah, similar to United Kingdom, uh, against Euro, that's different to United Kingdom, um, and so on. And this was, um, yes, this was um, a big enemy, and therefore they had about 10 or perhaps. Uh, uh, just 10 percent or something uh, like that. So it was not, o not only the decision from Angela Merkel not to close the border. The border was open. She hasn't opened the border because she didn't close it. So I think I think it was right in this situation to decide in this way. Yes, we can. I think that's a slogan, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have problems with refugees. And we had problems, sure. Mm. Procedures who are not working, not enough money, all at the beginning, uh, too much bureaucracy and, and so on. On the other hand, we need people from other countries, from other states. 
we need more and more about uh, 400,000 people for our jobs, different jobs. So we need to have migration, we need to have um, um, uh, uh, measures, we need, um, uh, yes, yes, we need uh, procedures uh, to uh, come uh, people from other countries uh, to Germany. Uh, but I think this was uh, for the uh, alternative for Germany, that was uh, wonderful for, the, uh, for them that now refugees are coming, so they. Uh, mm. Could um, uh, enforce their uh, strength in their disinformation campaign and it's, so it's on. It's interesting that you say that basically their phenomenon is not so big that you say it's only 14, 15 percent. In France, it's different. In France, the uh, far right. Look at Austria uh, uh, before party, the elections. Austria before the elections, uh, but now France is the country you live in. Do you and you? What what do you say? What, how come uh, is it in France so much bigger? And partly even uh, it's an exception because usually right-wing populists are stronger in regions where there are no foreigners, but partly also in regions with foreigners, like um, the South, Marseille. Right, uh, so in France you do have extreme left populists, people who support 100% marginal income tax rate. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding, it's just the tax rate would be 100% marginal income tax. Uh, rate uh, and then you also have extreme right populist, uh, what's used to be called Front National, now it's called Rassemblement National, and uh, this is uh, interestingly in, in, that's an interesting question which is now very well studied. There is a book which just came out in French called Origins of Populism. It will be translated into English, I guess, next year. And uh, in France, you have very good data very detailed data on what happens in which part of France. And in France, you have this diagonal divide, the empty diagonal. This is, uh, it's uh, probably similar to American flyover states. Mm -hmm. This is the place where nothing happens, where deindustrialization affected communities. And so what these uh, scholars show, they show it's an economic shock. Mm -hmm. It's also this spatial issue where uh, places are losing population and people have nobody to talk to. So this desocialization is a big issue. A phenomenon which is big in Russia as well. Uh, which is uh, big in Russia, but in Russia you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, an opportunity to vote uh, in an election, right? So um, in, uh, in, those, in those places, uh, people also are unhappy and people are also distrusting the state and other people. And so these are the people who vote for extreme right. And this is the answer to the question which was discussed in the previous panel. Why those people who lost their jobs or lost their lifetime opportunity, uh, careers or uh, are becoming insecure economically, why do they move to the extreme right while you already have extreme left? Mm -hmm. And the tradition is extreme left attracts educated people and pro-social people. Mm -hmm. Extreme right it, it attracts people who don't trust anybody. And so why? Because they also don't trust the bureaucrats. They don't trust the civil servants. And so they don't believe in redistribution because redistribution is done by the state. And since you don't trust anybody, you prefer to vote for Marine Le Pen. And since you're asking the question about the South, Marseille, uh, Marianne Marichal, so this is a different story. This is indeed a story which is somewhat similar to AFDA where the security crime terrorism is used. And this is, this is a completely different narrative. Currently, these wings of uh, this party are in the same party, but it looks like uh, they fight each other, and maybe one of them will actually take over. And here, uh, just I, one, one point before, uh, I mean, to add to your question, um, there is lots of um, allegation that the extreme right in both in France as in Germany gets support from the Russian state or actors close to the Russian state. I wouldn't call that allegation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's exactly. not an allegation. In France, Thank it's not you. an allegation. It's Thank a fact, you. Huh? Exactly. We know that the Front National got a credit of more than a million from a bank. Ten close, million. Uh, ten, million tel, ten million euros close to a bank, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to uh, a Russian actor close to the Kremlin. Um, now, um, how much is the, uh, would the allegation that you say this happens and all of this rising far right and far left is, uh, is because of Russia, um, is because of the Russian state, 
Um, would you would you agree to that, or is this uh, a different relationship? I mean, you can't you can't build fear if nothing exists to have that fear. So let's let's be also very honest. Genuine fears exist in our societies. They have good grounds. They're well structured and well motivated. If I were asked, let's do a little little exercise here. How many of you? raise your hand, are fearful about the future of, for the next years of your country. Really worry generally about, about what's going to happen in your country. About, you know, probably, let's say, 60% of the room, maybe, maybe more. So we, do f we have real f fears. The only difference is how do we decide to respond to those fears. And probably the majority in this room will say we have to work more together, more constructively, be more inclusive. We have to fight for democratic principles. We have to fight for human rights and so on. But there'll be another room in another uh, hotel, in another conference, where people say we have to rally against them because they are the major, the major problem, whatever that group is, especially right now today in, in democracies. And I think that differentiation today creates that huge polarization you see in France, you see in Poland, you see in every of our, uh, of our single countries, and that's truly what worries me. Now about Russia. Russia is, of course, using something that already exists. So the fear, the grievances, one against the other, and it's using real tools uh, through disinformation, through fake news, through supporting political parties on the Right, but also on the left. Let's not, you know, the Kremlin doesn't really differentiate. It seems it's closer to the to the right, but if they have an opportunity to support the far left, uh, to destabilize the system, and to divide the societies even uh, even further, it's going to do it. It's a you know, it's a Roman divide and rule. And it, it's it's an old tool. But that's why the homework has to be he done here, here in our countries. If we can't focus on uh, we can't uh, deal with uh, kind of uh, changing this polarization, bringing people closer, starting dialogue again, then we're doomed. Democracy is doomed because we start to see other political parties as enemies. We start to see institutions as not legitimate. And that's the end. You know, that's how democracies die. A great book that I recommend you read also. Um, and then, then the, the question is to, to that. Um, you say basically that this kind of propaganda is a fuel only, uh, d driving something that is already there. But now, uh, Sergei, you know a little bit Russian government also from the inside as an economic advisor. Do you know many of the actors? Um, how big would you uh, assess uh, how, how serious is this threat of the propaganda? And also, um, like, what do you respond to people? For example, I know there is Russian... Uh, close to state actors channels that already reported on this forum and that said here is a meeting of all the people that hate Russia I have to say uh, if you if, if you if there's still space in the article I love Russia and Russians um, and and I, I think most of the people in this room uh, l love Russia but um, they, 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 they wrote that and they would say yes this is what you do, but you do the exactly same thing. Radio Svoboda or Deutsche Welle also uh, uh, report on the same level in, in Russia. Do you, do, what do you t tell to people who say this is exactly the same thing? Uh, Russia Today or Deutsche Welle or Radio Svoboda and uh, Sputnik. So first and foremost, let me say that Katarzyna, what Katarzyna said is exactly true. And uh, you also see that whenever Kremlin wants to do things like this, where it's hard to uh, reinforce the existing divide, uh, divides, Kremlin fails. And we saw a failed coup in Montenegro. We saw Kremlin's efforts to stop the referendum on renaming uh, Macedonia, now called Nor Northern Macedonia. Both efforts uh, were there in Greece and in, in Northern Macedonia, and they failed. So there are ways to step up to that. They also tried to hack into President, well, at that point, presidential candidate Macron's campaign. Uh, president, presidential campaign was prepared. So they hacked into a decoy part of the campaign and got access to fictitious emails. Uh, they also uh, were disclosed and revealed by President Macron in front of President Putin as non-media. So when RT and Sputnik asked President Macron in Versailles in press conference, uh, which was given by Putin and 
Macron. Macron said, uh, I do not think you're journalists. I don't, I don't really think you're journalists, you're agents of influence. And the difference here is in standards, and this is exactly where institutions come in. So in the UK, for example, RT is being fined and warned again and again because there is an independent regulator which establishes that what Radio Svoboda does is journalism, mm -hmm. and what RT and, and uh, Sputnik does, it's not. I'll give you an example. So every few months, RT comes to me and says, come to us, give us an interview. And I say, look, uh, I work, uh, that was when I worked at IBRD, and I said, I work at IBRD, there will be a colleague with me coming from IBRD, so if you take my words out of context, we will have to sue you. Mm -hmm. And they would say, you should not suspect us, we never do that, but then they disappear because they are afraid of that, and that is their modus operandi. And, uh, and then this is, this is how they operate. It's just a very simple thing. Now, they also say, we interfere in your elections, but you've been interfering in ours. So what is different? There is a big difference. When Americans invest in supporting democracy and freedoms around the world, with the world, Americans do that proudly. They think this is a value to be supported. Russia keeps denying its inter interference. Apparently, Russia believes it's something not to be proud of. And that is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So Russia wants to be like the civilized world. Civilized world doesn't want to be like Russia. This is the difference in models, and I think it's a huge difference. Oh, yeah, I have to, I have to think about that. Many people, but also argue that uh, to the last subject of our discussion here, uh, that the, the, the influence uh, of this uh, election uh, uh, interference, as you said, also are not always successful. But there's another factor some uh, experts see as more dangerous, uh, uh, that there is a form of corruption. And now first, I wanted to also ask you with Menti some question about corruption, but I think it is too much walking back and forth and, and re-switching the computer on. But um, in short, I will uh, remind of the definition of Transparency International, what corruption is. It is the abuse of delegated power for personal benefit. So the abuse of delegated power for personal benefit. And there is a saying that many German businessmen or uh, uh, also politicians are receptive to this kind of abuse of delegated power for personal benefit uh, helping uh, 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 dictatorships from around the world. Uh, let's let's not only speak about uh, the the one country, uh, but also about Saudi Arabia. Let's speak about uh, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Let's speak about different authoritarian regimes where uh, um, parts of the elite in German society are highly in, in, in have relationships with that we call corruption. Uh, yes, corruption, well, similar to fear, I cannot find any good term uh, regarding corruption. Um, corruption destroys also trust in um, uh, state authorities and in, in politicians and in politics in general. Uh, so it's also a danger for democracy. Um, and yeah, there is also corruption existing in Germany, sure. But people are acting, have power, or want to have more power. I think there's the danger that they could be corrupt. Okay. Um, so, so therefore we need, and that's the most important thing, we need transparency in a broader way. Uh, we need more information, we need um, regulation to protect the whistleblower. That's really important because they have one main task. They, um, uh, they um, can uh, look at, um, uh, at uh, developments mm. inside government, um, um, the violating the rules and looking at corruption in different ways uh, inside or outside uh, Germany and we don't have at this moment uh, regulations for whistleblowers um, this, uh, and uh, Snowden, okay, we all know him, but there are also 
other uh, people who would give um, uh, information about something who's going wrong. So yes, we uh, there is corruption. I'm a member of Transparency International in Germany. Our uh, foundation uh, has uh, in different uh, countries uh, from time to time cooperation uh, with Transparency, Transparency International. And uh, really important is to have um, functioning structures to have a principle that not only one has to decide uh, if you are dealing with uh, budget, uh, but uh, the more people and uh, different structure, uh, structures and controlling themselves and so on. Uh, and uh, we have uh, really to um, put more power to fight corruption also in Germany, I think. Through, through transparency, yeah? Yeah, uh, one thing is transparency. Sure, then you have uh, um, uh, control um, inside uh, uh, um, our um, uh, deciding processes. Yeah. There, you need more than one or two people. Um, therefore, there are a lot of things um, uh, you can do, and it's not new. Uh, no, not new, but you have to do it. And um, we are looking uh, also in Germany at Sweden. Uh, it's uh, what, what the f I think the first country in Germany where it's functioning structures against corruption, ombudsman system, and so on. Um, but you have to be aware of this, yep. and you have to make bring it to the public, and not oh we cannot uh, speak about it. Yep. Then I mean, you have uh, the others who tell their stories, not uh, the the true story. The man who is most successfully bringing uh, to the public concrete cases Impressive, of corruption, really, um, yes. You, but you mentioned today that your documentation today the uh, uh, your NGO against corruption has been declared a foreign agent. Yeah. Hmm? Um, oh. uh, let's welcome, hope. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if, I, if I can add yes. just to this, because the corruption issue is quite uh, quite important. Mm, I think one of the things that Poland should be extremely proud of since 1989 was, was lowering the corruption levels on, in general. I think we, we are one of the, uh, on one of the least corrupted uh, countries, not only in the region, but, but in Europe. We've had in the, ranking. in the rankings consistently. Uh, and I'm speaking mainly about the you know, day to day corruption. What was you know in the past normal? So I, when I got my when I got my uh, driver's license when I was 18, I remember you know being stopped by policemen and they would always ask me for bribes. That was normal. Today, nobody would imagine that. I mean, if 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 somebody would ask you for a bribe, you would call the other police <laughs> or whatever. You or you would, you would think you're being it's a movie like somebody's filming you. So you definitely would not give that. So so we did on the on the day to day level on every you know single aspect for. For, for uh, citizens, we did uh, we have been able to do that. Of course, it's a different story on the higher level corruption, and yeah. you hear these stories coming out uh, very often, both uh, with the previous government and with this government. But the challenge that I see right now, uh, and we see that also in the United States, other countries, is that people stop caring about high level corruption. Because if this is my tribe, I don't care. You know, I don't listen to that. Okay, okay, they steal, but the others also uh, were stealing. So we have, so we are starting to become immunized uh, to scandals, just like we have been immunized mm -hmm. to Donald Trump's tweets, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just, you just don't react to them uh, anymore. And I think that's a new danger that I have not seen before, and that is what worries me. Because then, if uh, somebody is in power. Uh, they know that uh, any corruption scandal would not change their very base. You know, it's going to be said, okay, I mean, this happened, but the other is going to do even worse. So, so I think this is a new challenge we haven't seen before. Yeah, this is uh, just uh, uh, for a moment. This is a criticism against uh, uh, against your NGO against corruption that some people say in Russia through the allegation and through the popularization of these videos, people get immune. Um, against uh, scandals of corruption. Sorry, S Sergei. Yeah, I, I wanted to say it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. But in order to weaponize this argument, you need corruption on the other side. So if uh, Emmanuel Macron were corrupt, that would have destroyed him. If uh, Barack Obama would be corrupt, that would be destroying him as well. And so this is this is a very important lesson for whoever wants to take on these regimes 
You need to be clean yourself. You need to be beyond reproach. And talking about the fear of corruption, I would say that the biggest fear related to corruption for Russians is indeed that Russia is destined to be corrupt. Russia has been corrupt, and Russia will be corrupt, and even if opposition is not corrupt today, once it comes over and takes over power, it will be corrupt. And I think we need to address this fear. The simple way is just to look at, say, Republic of Georgia, where you had a lot of corruption before, and suddenly you don't. And this is doable. Right now there is high-level corruption in Georgia, of course, but low-level corruption has been eradicated. You also, even Ukraine, which has always been more corrupt than Russia, in Ukraine you can identify pockets of uh, successful anti-corruption policies, which actually deliver. And we don't have time to talk about that in detail, but even in Ukraine, which is always used in Russia as an example of uncurable oligarchic state and corruption throughout the system, you still have successful anti-corruption uh, case study. Case to study. also set a good example, not only about corruption, propaganda, and about fear, um, about democracy, we should open the floor. So I think, uh, please, who wants to um, ask the panelist a question, please uh, identify yourself. I see one question here. Ольга Лавриненко, социологист с Польши Академии of Sciences. Since I am a researcher, I have a little bit of a methodological question, Professor Guriev. So uh, very often sociologists and political scientists, when study uh, the voting for the populist parties in the European Union, uh, concentrate on the social cultural uh, factors such as trust or values, and even argue that uh, economic factors such as unemployment uh, rate change or GDP uh, growth change uh, are other weak predictors of the voting for the populist parties. And when they run regression models uh, and include these factors, these variables to the models, uh, the output indicates that these are weak predictors. So what do you think about this as an economist? And uh, what kind of factors, if any, uh, could be included to these models uh, in order to verify empirically these models of voting uh, for the populist parties? Okay, wow. Well, a complex question about the uh, uh, factors that drive into the uh, success of populist parties. More question. Yeah. See Sven Gerst and Alexander and yeah. yes, Sasha. Hi, my name is. Can you hear me? Yeah, my, hi, my name is Sven. Um, I'm a PhD student in uh, political philosophy and I have a question about the social trust issue that we're, you were talking about. I also think that social trust is uh, an undervalued topic. Um, but the question is how do we get there? So far we said all oh, fear is bad and return to the Schmittian political economy is bad where we fight uh, friend versus enemy. How do we create a trust? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind as a political economist is decentralize, bring uh, the institutions back to the people on the ground, but that's not a good campaign to run on, and I think especially in Russia it would not be a good campaign to run on to decentralize the country and maybe break it up into smaller regions and full power to them, so how do we deal with that obstacle? Because ultimately that's what it boils down to, I guess. Yeah. 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 First Alexander. Uh, a third one, and, and then we take a sec. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Svetlana Hutko. Uh, actually, round. my question is uh, as follows. Uh, for Pacific Asia, there are a set of studies which show that actually economic growth and corruption, they are positively correlated. And in China, for example, the economic growth um, stimulates the corruption. It's, it's quite like, you know, mixed mode and very controversial results which uh, raised a huge discussion around all this stuff. Uh, next, let's take uh, the Russian situation, actually. <laughs> if it's about identity and if it's about being, like, you know, uh, actually uh, always kind of the country where people, uh, they feel okay when the country is grabbing more lands, and corruption is a kind of the perceived destiny for the country. And we still have these phantomic uh, Russian empire and Soviet empire mixed phantomic pains, which we have like, you know, in case of Crimea, Georgia, Donbass, 
uh, you name the country around uh, due to this, you know, limited sovereignty politics, which is still on a go. Mm -hmm. So under all this, what would be the future for European security, for the global security, also taking into account, like, you know, this kind of the um, flirting between China and Russia and the US and Europe, I mean, like, yeah. The line might be endless, actually, because it's so, not only just about interest, so, it's about safety for life for now. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the question about c uh, c corruption and the economic effect, I think, is an important one. And I think that's for, for Sergei. I mean, remembering the definition of transparency international for corruption is the abuse of delegated power for personal benefit. So now I'm interested how this can correlate with positive economic development. <laughs> Thanks. L let me also take previous questions as well. Uh, so some of the previous questions as well on the methodology of uh, impact of uh, economic uh, shocks on uh, vote for populists. Uh, there is actually a lot of research showing that long-term trends, secular trends such as automation and China import shock, the increase in import from China since China joined WTO, that affects uh, populist vote and polarization in the US and in Europe. I also have a paper on Europe, how the shock during the recent economic crisis at the subnational, at the local level in Europe, has resulted in increased vote for populism, and the, ma uh, the magnitude is quite large. Each percentage point of increase in unemployment rate before and after the crisis results in one or two percentage points in populist vote share. But uh, once again, let me actually say that modern research in economics on populism and trust cannot be done without talking to sociologists and political scientists. And I, I mentioned that book by my co-author Jan Algan, and his co-authors, one of them is actually a political scientist on origins of populism. Well, there is a reference to Hannah Arendt, obviously. Uh, you always look at trust, you always look at uh, things like social interaction, you look at life satisfaction, you look at other measures which are not traditionally used in economics. But methodologically, you can look up this paper, it was published in Brookings Papers on Economic Affairs 2017, and we actually identify the causal link between economic shocks and, and vote for, po for populists in Europe. We also see that the economic shocks also result in lower trust in national and European institutions. People don't blame United Nations for crisis. People don't blame local police for crisis. People don't blame church. They blame, na they blame national and European politicians. And I should say that, uh, as Professor Fukuyama said, there is some truth in that. So uh, on Sven's question, I, uh, I think decentralization is actually a very good political platform in Russia, given more power to regions and to municipalities is something that many people think is fair making power more accountable, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good platform. Uh, also, providing resources to the regions to deliver on whatever promises local politicians make. But there is another innovation which I think is very important. How can you increase trust in politics? You create what's called deliberative democracy. You create citizen assemblies, right? This is, this is the tool which is now used in many countries, but probably most successful in Ireland, where some issues that professional politicians wouldn't touch such as gay marriage uh, or uh, green tax, uh, green carbon taxes, right? These issues are better discussed by citizens' assemblies. When you randomly pick up normal people from the street and ask them to discuss this issue, they bring in experts, they produce recommendations, they take these recommendations to the parliament, and the parliament knows that these are normal people. They're representatives of the voters. It's very hard to say, who are you? We don't know who you are. So this, I think, is a measure which creates, creates uh, deliberation and trust. On corruption and growth, there is no uh, good research which identifies the positive causal effect from corrup corruption to growth, but there is a, a lot of research which identifies negative effect. And uh, I should say that the next transition report of EBRD does exactly this. It will be published in November. And uh, I will give you just one number for Ukraine. If Ukraine were half as corrupt, if Ukraine covered half the gap in terms of corruption between Ukraine and, say, Poland, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine economic growth would be one percentage point faster every every year. So this is our estimate, and we have lots of numbers like this, and we identify the causal link between uh, lower corruption and and, and development.
It's about the trust question, social Yes, I, I also wanted to say about, about local government, I think Poland is again a great example of, of how to decentralize and uh, local government in Poland has one of the highest levels of trust. We see that through the board, uh, the same uh, the same mayors, the same people who really did a good job, people see it, feel it, are elected again. Uh, the, the regions are quite independent from the central government. Of course, there is a, a tendency now to reverse some of these but but as for now uh, that's a very strong uh, strong element of building social trust uh, but I also uh, but I, I in social trust Poland I don't think has at the end of the day succeeded because when we look at the polls at when we look at the statistics it turns out that people here in Poland trust each other the least in the region so although we had all those Less than yeah, Czech, yeah, uh, yeah that, German. That, and actually there's a lot of studies on this very deep studies that have been um, done year after year after year and we don't see much progress in this area you don't trust your family you don't trust your surroundings you don't trust the institutions and so on so there are historical reminiscences that you it's very hard to move away from I, I would remind you that Western democracies had you know anything between 60 80 to 200 years years to, to develop that that social trust, social capital layer. It's a very slow process. It can be very easily reversed. So I think that's one of one of the huge challenges. And the last thing I wanted to say, because that's also what, what studies show, we say that a lot of the, the, the populism um, movement is based on the problems with economy, economic discrepancies, the v question of cities versus, versus uh, uh, urban uh, countryside. Yeah. Professor Fukuyama said that it's going to be a reverse because people are moving to cities, they're younger, but that's not everywhere true. Again, if you look at studies in Poland, one of the bigger divide is between young male and female. So young female are much more optimistic when it comes to the future, much more independent, much more progressive. Uh, they uh, are not willing to, to you know, fall into a traditional family model, whereas young boys or young men actually are completely lost in this because they've been raised in the expectation that everything is as it was, mm -hmm. the traditional mm -hmm. way, and they can't really find a new role for each other. So what do they do? They vote for parties that are not even, you know, right they're far right they're far right and the 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 far right uh, um, parties uh, that are not in the in the current parliament well they, they are in the current parliament but they're they're still marginal they, they have a few percent most of their voters are young male not the older uh, but but actually young young male so we have to remember that there's a lot of changes each society has a different uh, experience and layer and we have to look in, uh, at this very in a very complex way not only assuming that it's city versus countryside that it's you know poor versus rich and so on you, uh, the globalization has really forced us to look at at all the processes that we took for granted and uh, and it's very uh, difficult to address these wow it's uh, the, the gender question in this context i find very interesting because yes. I agree uh, that I see also that the individualization of society seems to be even more confusing for males. Yes. But um, d d d tell me um, what your answer to the rebuild of trust is. Um, yes, I think uh, decentralization is um, one step. Federalism understanding in Germany is uh, this way, but I think participation of people at the beginning of processes, at the beginning of uh, planning or, or an airport or something like that or a station or so on, uh, participation of people in different ways. You mentioned citizen assemblies and so on. It's all also different groups. But I think this is um, one possibility to uh, try to create uh, uh, trust and transparency. Transparency, information, and really important, 
education, education to give the people mm. the uh, more information about procedure procedures. It's not so complex they uh, they are afraid of. Mm. Uh, so I think education, information, and transparency is really important to create trust. But then you have to have, of course, governments that care and want to do it. Because for a lot of governments, it's sure. great to have ignorant citizens uh, that you know create that that mm -hmm. polarization. So I think this is this is the issue. Then I would now give the last question to Alex Alexander. Uh, two questions, okay. Yeah, please. And then... Dmitry Shubkunov, Russia, sociolog. My question my question, Dmitry Shubkunov, uh, my question is about the structure of fear, because we know that uh, uh, the structure of fear is subconscious, it is expressed in language and historical memory. To what extent will it change in the coming centuries? Because we as people are afraid of the future and of losing uh, our empowerment. Uh, Alexander Solovyov, one of the ex-candidates to Moscow City Duma. I have a question to uh, Sergei Guriev. Um, let's imagine the situation when you're a minister of Russian economics. Uh, a minister of Russian economics uh, not in an authoritarian country, in a normal country, which is quite difficult to imagine right now, but still. Um, well, I would be happy to see you as a minister if I, if I was a president of if I was if I was a president of the Russian Federation, that would be one of my first steps, actually. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so let's imagine your first hour, not a day, hour in the office. What would be the first three documents you would sign? That's very interesting. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask the same question to Alexei Navalny, but we uh, we ran out of time. Um, so here, yeah, I would I would uh, I think this I think thinking about time. Think well about the answer because that is a good that's a good uh, ending statement even. Yeah. Um, now um, about the question about the future of fear over the coming ten years, right? And 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 uh, you, you because you nodded and you said you you you, you think you have a, 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 an answer to that. No, I don't yeah. think I have an answer to that because I think yes, if seventy percent of people here in, in in this auditorium are afraid of the future, then we will have an of, of on. Uh, they, they said they are afraid of the future of the development of their country. Of their country, yes. Yeah. Because if you are afraid of this development, then uh, I think it's uh, a sign that uh, we will have an ongoing fear if you are uncertain what will happen in 10 or 20 years. So what we have to do is, as politicians, to explain what kind of solutions we have to uh, give answers to the uh, big challenges we are facing. And we know what kind of challenges to the economy, are. climate uh, change, economy, security, and so on. And uh, I think we need, um, uh, that's a new um, uh, issue, a new point, we need also to strengthen the international structures. Uh, United Nations, uh, VTO, and so on. Uh, we have a development uh, to violate all these structures. They were built after the end of the Second World War and are really important. And I think if we would have some functioning structures, better structures, uh, then perhaps we can give a positive perspective to the future, not only to be uh, to have uh, fear about uh, the development. So uh, more effort into uh, the in international structures and institutions to, to keep them alive and give them life. Um, sorry? Yeah. Oh, oh, we have the microphone scarves. <laughs> Ten years. Uh, last week at the Warsaw Security Forum, we organized a, a panel, night owl session, so over wine, that was called Humankind Expiration Date 2050. 
So uh, actually a number of very senior politicians, including congressmen, uh, foreign ministers, and so on, were seriously debating whether humankind will expire, we will all die in the next 40 years. So yeah, I think there's a lot of fear on every single level. We're talking about climate change, the, the big comeback of nuclear disaster. We forgot we for, that this exists, but there's again a fear of nuclear conflict uh, in the world, the question of revealing democracies. I mean, you name it. And if you were to think about everything, I don't think anybody here would sleep at night. And yet we have to persist, yes? We have to move forward and we have to hope that somehow as humanity, as humankind, we're going to have to come together and address these big challenges. But I think we have to do it by sticking to our values. And I think this room is very special because I'm sure we all share very similar values. We've seen wh that where democracies thrive, it's much easier to find consensus and solve problems. Where you don't have democracies, where you have authoritarian regimes or semi-authoritarian regimes, uh, you uh, not only are not able to solve bigger problems, you're less uh, likely to cooperate, uh, you're less likely to build consensus over time. So I think a lot trust. of the solutions for the world is more democracy, not less democracy. And I hope if we can continue that direction because the number of democracies is still growing. Let's, despite the, the, you know, the, the setbacks we've seen, it's not as bad as it's sometimes perceived. So I think if we continue there, we're much more, uh, we have a bigger chance to not expire in 2050. You mean liberal democracies, liberal. not illiberal. Liberal, absolutely. Okay. Uh, assume I'm talking about liberal democracies every time I talk. Um, I think Alexander's question is great in the sense that uh, this discussion has to happen. We need to talk very openly, not about who's to blame, but what's to be done. These are the two main Russian questions, right, from 19th century. And uh, the more specific we are about constructive agenda after the regime has changed, the sooner the regime will change. Why? Because people will be less afraid of the regime change when they see their constructive plans, that it's not going to be turbulence, there'll be life after uh, whatever this guy whose Martians are going to take away. Um, uh, but uh, in, in that way, in, in that sense, of course this discussion needs to be pursued. No one single person cannot really give all the answers. And I'm only a few weeks after EBRD. In EBRD, I was not allowed to think about those issues. Uh, Russia is our shareholder. Russian government was our shareholder. So I was not able even to talk about those issues, even to think about those issues. But actually, two days ago, I gave an interview to TV Rain, which uh, eventually took out of this interview two solutions that I can offer right now to Russian government. One is to release Michael Calvi. <laughs> And the other one was uh, to stop counter sanctions, which I think are good ideas. But there is much more you can just achieve by undoing what this government has done in recent years. I also was talking about the need to stop prosecuting uh, FBK. I also uh, was uh, talking about other things where you fight modern technology, isolation in all kinds of ways. I think uh, there are many way, many things you can do, and uh, I see Sergei Alexashenko here. We uh, Last time we wrote programs of reforms was, I think, 2012 for the uh, Russian government. If you take this report on how to promote competition and fight corruption in Russia, you can still implement it. Things have not improved, unfortunately. So there are many things you can do. Overall, uh, you need to stand up and say, we are going to be a normal European country. We know how to do that. Many countries have done that. Poland is one example of that. You don't need to join European Union to promote European integration. You can move towards Europe simply looking at what's called a key communitaire and implementing them actually without even talking to Europe about accession. You always talk about countries like uh, Baltic states, which would tell, tell you in 1990s nobody was welcoming us to NATO or European Union, but we still reformed and eventually they had to admit us. And I think that's, that's uh, the road. Whether Europe admits Russia as a member or not, it's a different question. But European institutions actually work, actually bring peace and prosperity and so on. As an immediate thing, as an immediate signal how, uh, that uh, we like other countries, I would suggest, for example, uh, removing unilaterally visas for OECD citizens. So we welcome
people from uh, more developed countries. We want their human capital, their investment, and so on. But by just undoing all the stupid barriers that have been introduced in the recent years, will bring a lot of growth to the Russian economy. I think that is good closing remarks, and it's right that the Russian had the last words, because we are also interested what's happening in Russia. Um, thank you very much, and now we will have theater. Thank you so much. Я очень коротко скажу техническое объявление в соседнем зале в 7 часов вечера. Very short technical announcement in the room next door at 7 p.m. There will be uh, a theater play, Tolstoy and Stolypin private correspondence, uh, directed by Vladimir Mirzoyev. So it starts at 7 p.m. after the uh, spectacle, after the show, there will be a banquet.